Uh, thank you, Robert and Mark. I appreciate your comments, and again, appreciate the use of this facility. Uh, it's very nice. Our first panel will be on the trends and challenges on the U.S. border, and our moderator will be Frank Gavin. Frank is a historian by training. He uh, focuses his research on U.S. foreign policy, global governance, national security affairs, nuclear strategy, and arms control, just to list a few of them. There's a more extended bio in the packet you picked up downstairs on Frank. He is uh, the director of the Robert Strauss Center on International Security and Law. Thank you, Frank. We could call the panelists up for the first panel. We might as well. So I want to also welcome everyone here on behalf of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Uh, this is really a remarkable gathering, and I was thinking about it today. This is exactly the type of thing, an event, an activity, an endeavor that the Strauss Center uh, was established to set up. Uh, the Strauss Center was created several years ago with the idea, with several ideas in mind. One of the most important was to be a platform to bring different people together, different types of people from different sectors, different parts of society in order to discuss the most pressing global challenges of the day. And when you think about the gathering and group of people we have here today, it's a perfect example uh, of what we were set up to do. Uh, first, a uh, absolutely terrific partnership with the LBJ Library and Mark Updegrove, their visionary leader. As you can see, this is an extraordinary space. Uh, I can tell you as a presidential historian, there is no presidential library that does more of these type of activities to bring people together. Of course, the University of Texas and the uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs under uh, the leadership of our terrific new dean uh, as a place to both educate the next generation of scholars to think about these important issues, but also to generate the new ideas and the new scholarship to help uh, solve some of these pressing uh, global problems. Uh, but also the Austin Crime Commission and their, uh, Kerry Roberts and their uh, terrific team. I mean, this is exactly the kind of activity that doesn't happen at other universities, where you bring together a group from the university, from the private sector, from the public sector, law enforcement, uh, state, local, national government. Uh, these problems that we're gonna talk about today, uh, we're not going to agree on exactly what the problems are. We're not gonna necessarily agree on exactly what the right solutions are, but the only way we're going to make any progress is to bring together the different interested actors who can bring their expertise and knowledge together. And if you look around the room today, if you look on this panel, if you look at the people we'll be uh, talking today, I, I can't imagine a better way of bringing together uh, different interested parties, different expert knowledge to talk, to share ideas, to come up with uh, creative solutions to these uh, pressing problems. So I'm extraordinarily proud that the Strauss Center is involved in this partnership with the library, with the Austin Crime Commission, because this is exactly uh, what we were set, uh, what we were established to do. But we were also established to think about these pressing challenges of the 21st century in different ways. And I think Dean Hutchins laid this out beautifully. There are no longer any problems that are just global, and there's no longer any problems that are just local. The intermixing, the coming together of these sets of problems is a profound change in how we think about these issues. And given that these issues are a profound challenge, we need to respond more creatively. I was just listing some of the issues that we're going to be talking about on this panel today. Immigration, narcotics, human trafficking, gangs. These are problems and issues and challenges that only 10, 15 years ago would have been seen as exclusively local. But as we know, and as we'll talk about today, there's an extraordinary global component to this. And not only are these problems showing the intermixing between global, local, 
but they're also showing that any potential future solution to these issues have to involve better institutional responses and better coordination between all the actors that are involved in this. And we know that this is a big challenge, right? Local law enforcement faces extraordinary challenges uh, just in their sort of normal day-to-day -day operations. You add this layer of global challenges as well, and I can only imagine the type of help and coordination they will need. Same on the national and international level. They look at these things from a global perspective, yet they need to understand what's going on in the ground. So this coordination, this interaction, this uh, better institutional responses to these pressing uh, challenges. Again, something that the Strauss Center was set up to do and, I, uh, and to help us think about, and that's why I, am, I could not be prouder and happier of this, uh, uh, participate in this conference. Fortunately, um, as these are very difficult problems, but fortunately we have a terrific group of experts assembled here today to get us started off. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about their biographies. They have you in front, uh, you have them in front of you, but we've really assembled three of um, uh, the most um, insightful people in the area uh, that can talk about these uh, truly challenging issues. And what I'm going to suggest is that we sort of go in uh, the order here and that each of our panelists is going to speak between 10 and 15 minutes. They have uh, uh, um, some slides they want to uh, present as well. And then after that, we'll have a little brief discussion up here, start off with some questions, and we'll open up to the uh, audience. So um, without further ado, maybe uh, should we start? We'll start with, we'll start with um, um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Onsley. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well, all adequately anyway? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ricardo Ainsley, and uh, I'm going to talk this morning about the law enforcement challenges that Mexico is facing. I spent the last two years working on a book about Mexico's war against the drug cartels, uh, and that book has involved sort of two strategies. One part of it has involved interviewing uh, people in the Mexican government, high uh, people such as the head of the uh, National Intelligence Agency in Mexico, a man named Guillermo Valdez, uh, the, uh, the head of the Public Security Secretariat, a man named Genaro Garcia Luna, under whose auspices is the federal police, um, the uh, former interior ministry, minister who was in Calderon's security cabinet, a man Eduardo Medina Mora. So I've, I've, I've tried to understand Mexico's strategy in this drug war at that sort of level. Um, and then I've also spent uh, the bulk of my time in Juarez, Mexico, which is the epicenter of this war, as, as you'll see. So um, part of my interest has been to try to understand the, the Mexican government's strategy and what I've learned from, from the three security cabinet members that I've just mentioned is that the, the basic outlines of the government strategy is this. First, to recover territory from the cartels. As was mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, there are broad swaths of the country that have been basically um, relinquished or had been basically relinquished to the control of the cartels. And so the first part of the Mexican government strategy involved trying to uh, recover, that's actually a direct quote from one of these security cabinet members, recover territory from the cartels, which I think is also a kind of a, a way of acknowledging the depth of penetration of the cartels. Uh, secondly, the, the strategy is what they call the disarticulation of drug trafficking organizations. And over the last three years, every cartel has, uh, has had uh, leadership that's been taken down, either arrested or, 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 or killed in the process of uh, strategies, um, activities. So, uh, and then thirdly, uh, uh, strengthening institutions. And I'm gonna focus especially on the law enforcement issue. In December 2006, which is when Calderon took office and declared the war on the drug cartels, there was really a boots on the ground problem. The, there was very, the, the Mexican law enforcement system is basically municipal police at the city level. 
Then there's state police, which sometimes have various uh, groupings within them. And then there's the federal police and the, and the uh, uh, AFI, the Mexican FBI. Both the, the federal police and the AFI were really quite small at the time of, uh, of uh, Calderon entering government. The, the, um, the federal police had about 8,000 people. The AFI had about 6,000, so about 14,000 people to cover the country at the, in terms of federal law enforcement. Uh, Mexico City alone has 80,000 police, so really a woefully inadequate uh, number of people in terms of, of a law enforcement presence in the context of a, a situation in which the local law enforcement uh, agencies are the most susceptible to cartel influence. The municipal police in many of the cities that were under the control of the cartels were basically extensions of the cartels and so on. So you had a huge problem of mobilizing, finding the people to, uh, to begin to counteract this reality that as it existed in 2006. Uh, and that's what dictated the use of the Mexican army as a, as a start off point. Uh, Calderon immediately started sending uh, Mexican troops into the states, Michoacán, Sinaloa, uh, to some extent Chihuahua, Sonora. They were the most affected and the most under the control uh, of the cartels. So, so it's very clear that that was what was going on and that's, that there was no other alternative. There were no other uh, mechanisms uh, available, no other tools available to, to try to make uh, an impact on the situation. Ciudad Juarez is the, the city that I've spent, I've, I've made some 14 uh, trips there, I've spent a lot of time there, I've interviewed everybody from extensive interviews with the mayor and his people, the federal law enforcement, the, the federal police representative and some of, the, uh, some of their people in Juarez, but I've interviewed everybody from NGOs working with kids in marginalized communities. I've interviewed some people who had some, some sort of involvement, shall I say, with this problem. Um, I've interviewed school teachers. I've, I've really tried to understand on the ground what's really going on in the city, what's the impact, but also trying to understand how are these policies playing out in Juarez. Again, Juarez is the epicenter. Um, 25% of the casualties in Mexico, and, and we're talking now somewhere around 34,000 people who've been executed in the drug war in the last um, uh, three years. About a quarter of, of those, um, maybe a little less now, but a substantial percentage of the executions have taken place in one place, and that's in Juarez. Mexican government has deployed about 25% of its resources in terms of army and federal police to Juarez. So in my, uh, the reason I chose Juarez is because obviously uh, it's, I think it's the epicenter, but I, I think it's also the testing ground for what the Mexican government is trying to do. Um, the, in terms of our topic today, thinking about uh, uh, the amount of chaos, the amount of anarchy that, that's attendant to this problem is nowhere better seen than in Juarez. If you just look at the numbers of executions um, by year, uh, we, we're, we're actually way past 8,000 executions since uh, 2007 in Juarez. That's a huge, Juarez is a city of 1.3 million people. That's a lot of people. There's, we're talking about eight to 10 people a day uh, who are being executed in the streets of this city. Um, so this is the, st the staple of life in Juarez, and this is going on in rich communities, poor communities, business areas, in front of shopping malls, all over town. Everybody is, is, is encountering this stuff in the streets. The Juarez Police Department consists of 1,500 officers, or consisted in, in 2007 of 1,500 officers. The city had had that number of police for uh, 20 years. The city had doubled in size in those 20 years. So woefully few people to manage that. And, the, and, the, and the, the, the Juarez cartel was basically running the show of the, of the police department. This is the, the, the sort of the emblem of that reality. Uh, Saulo Reyes was the second in command of the uh, 
Juarez Municipal Police from 2007, January uh, to October 2000, that should say 2008, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a misprint. But he was imposed on the police department by the then mayor, a man named uh, Hector Murguilla, and, sh and shortly after, so he left this position, the number two man, the operations director of the police department, he left that position in October 2007 when the new uh, elections happened, the new mayor comes in and does not reappoint him. Uh, in January 2008, he is arrested in El Paso trying to bring in a ton of marijuana. So you really see the depth of the Juarez cartel's influence on the, on the Juarez uh, police department through this man. But the Juarez cartel basically used the police department as its armed extension. They called it La Linea. These guys would uh, protect drug shipments coming through town. They did the dirty work for the cartel. They did executions. They would pick up people, torture them, interrogate them. Um, uh, they had a variety of jobs, but they were basically at the beck and call of, of the, Juarez uh, the Juarez Police Department, I mean the Juarez Cartel. So in 2007, Sinaloa, the Sinaloa Cartel started its um, move on Juarez. And they spent about a year basically doing their research. They were stealthy. They were smart. They, they would kidnap key people, in, uh, torture them, get information from them. By the time that by January 2008, the, the Sinaloa cartel knew what police were playing what roles for the, for the uh, Juarez cartel. And this is when they made their move on the city. In January 2008 is when, you remember the statistics I showed you, 2007 there were 300 and some odd executions in, in Juarez. 2008, that number, uh, you know, 1,600 or more. So the war starts right here at this monument, the Monument to Fallen Police, January 26th, 2008. A few days before that, the third in command of the Juarez Police Department had been executed. On January 26, 2008, at this statue, a uh, narco message was left and it was titled, For Those Who Did Not Believe. And it lists five police officers who had been executed in the, in the prior few months, including the number three men who had just been executed. It also then had a section that, called, that was titled, For Those Who Still Do Not Believe, and it listed 17 officers. It listed their rank, their precincts, their police code names. It was the Sinaloa cartel telling the Juarez Police Department <laughs> that they were making their move. And within six months, all 17 of those people were either executed or they'd resigned their positions. <clears throat> this is a one, this, this is a police commander that I happened to be in Juarez when he was executed in the summer of, of 2009. Um, this is the number of police that have been executed in Juarez uh, over these years. And so you can see almost 300 police and basically in three years. That's, that's a lot of people. Um, in response to this, Calderon sends 2,500 troops to Juarez in March of 2008. Clearly, the Mexican government is aware that this situation is falling apart. Uh, the, there's a spike in executions. There's a spike in police executions. Uh, he sends in 2,500 troops. They immediately start uh, some pretty dramatic incidents. They, they arrested uh, uh, um, several police with drugs in their cars. There, there's a confrontation between, many confrontations between the police and the army. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there's a juncture at which the police refuse to leave their precincts because they're, they're actually, they're afraid of the army. Um, and in May of 2008, there's uh, the, the part of the agreement that, allowed, that led to the uh, uh, sending federal, uh, the army troops into Juarez was that the, the, uh, the, the mayor and the police department had to agree to, to what they call the confidence tests, uh, an attempt to sort of evaluate each of the police um, in terms of, of a variety of measures and, and things that they use to try to, to assess whether somebody is corrupt, including 
uh, lie detector tests, background checks, drug doping uh, tests, and so on. Uh, already you'd had 70 police resign and, and uh, several fired, um, and, uh, but, the, but the, uh, the executions continued here. Uh, the second in command in the police department was assassinated in May, and it prompted the resignation of the then uh, chief of police. The new chief of police that was brought in at the time was somebody who was picked by the, uh, by the army. He was, a, he was a former army guy. He came to Juarez to take over the police department. He was not a local guy. And he was clearly working closely with the army, which created police work stoppages and a lot of chaos within the situation. The army started patrolling. I'm talking very quickly because I've got a lot of ground to cover here, and I know I've only got a few minutes. But uh, uh, again, work stoppages, a lot of confusion, chaos in the city. And uh, by the end of October, the results of these confidence tests were in. 400 municipal police were fired. Another 44 had been assassinated. So almost a third of the Juarez police force was, uh, was, was gone by October when the army's patrolling. In February 2009, there's a, uh, um, a car, uh, the, another narco message that basically says, uh, we're going to execute a policeman every 48 hours until uh, Orduña, the, the former military man who would come in to take over, until he resigns. And they started making good on that threat, leading to, to his resignation in February 2009. That led to the second phase, I'd say, of the government, Mexican government's intervention in, in Juarez. They sent in 10,000 army and 2,000 federal police. They basically took over all policing functions in the city. They fired all the police. Basically, they were saying, we've got to start from scratch. Our efforts to clean up the police has, have failed. The confidence tests, the training, et cetera, has not worked. They, they send in federal forces to try to bring some sort of um, security to the city because you've got so many executions continuing to run uh, free. So this is uh, the, uh, the entrance of the Mexican army in force in, in spring of 2009. The level of anxiety in this city you cannot imagine. This is, these guys with red t-shirts uh, are forensics people coming to the site of an execution. They're wearing masks. They're afraid that they will be executed if they're identified. They're coming in under the, the protection of the Mexican army. This is the extent to which the city had sort of devolved into kind of a lawless condition and uh, very, very anxiety provoking to be in these streets for anybody. Um, in September, during this time, uh, the, uh, the, the, the army and the, and the uh, city government had been working to recruit new police the new they, they, they recruited nationally. They also went to, to uh, army garrisons to try to get current and former military people to come into Juarez. Um, and they managed to recruit some 3,000 people. These people were given new training that, it, that was sort of unprecedented in Juarez uh, for any municipal police anywhere. Number one, for the first time in Mexico, the, the local police, municipal police were using AR-15s, automatic weapons. They were trained by the military. And so um, the, the idea was that there was a, a different kind of engagement with the problem of law enforcement. And in September, the new police, as they were called, came in uh, to run things. Uh, in the summer of 2010, the federal police took over policing functions from um, the army. So they started working in conjunction with the new police. And so you, um, that started, uh, that made the federal police the target of a lot of the cartel violence. Uh, there was, a, um, I'm sure you, 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 you read about this, the uh, a car bomb that was set as a trap for the federal police in, the, in July of 2010. Uh, there was a, uh, the cartels, one of the cartels uh, uh, severely wounded somebody, left him on the street next to a car that had been uh, rigged 
with uh, explosives, and then somebody called the emergency response number, the federal police emergency response number, and when the federal police arrived, a bomb went off. Sort of Iraqi-style tactics, which the cartels have been very adept at emulating. Um, so the federal police increasingly uh, targeted, uh, shot in the streets, shot in groups, um, and, uh, and also in, in, in August you had, you had a, a, a federal police protest, about 200 officers protesting that their commander was um, uh, pushing them uh, to uh, extort businesses. That resulted in about 3,000 federal police being fired. Uh, this is, um, a, not, not just in Juarez, but nationally. This is an example of some of the, uh, of the federal police presence in the city. They set up roadblocks all over the city. They set them up. They'll be here two hours. They'll be in another place two hours uh, trying to uh, disrupt uh, the situation, but uh, the, the, the ease with which uh, cartel people and gangs uh, traverse the city. So um, currently, we've got uh, federal police and municipal police patrolling the streets together. The Army is now conducting operations in rural areas and, and on the periphery of the city. But we've got a tremendous hearts and minds problem here uh, in Juarez and throughout Mexico. Uh, people, uh, art, people in the streets, ordinary people, feel tremendously vulnerable. They feel unprotected. They feel that the government has not been able to sort of stop the violence, which, which, as you see from those numbers, uh, it hasn't, and that's that's the biggest problem that I think the Mexican government is having right now. That, that in spite of the fact that they've taken down many heads of cartels and and, and cartel capos, uh, lieutenants, uh, the street crime between and the violence between them, which is. Very complex. If I had time, I would really could really sort of map this out for you better in terms of the relationship between the cartels and the gangs that, that are under their employee, et cetera, all of which is part of the violence. It's not just sort of cartel to cartel. It's much more textured and complex than that. But the government is, uh, has not been able to, to stop that violence. And so I think a huge problem that the Mexican government faces right now is that is that it's not won the hearts and minds. Even though initially when, when Calderón set out on this uh, policy, uh, he had tremendous support throughout the country, tremendous support. But his popularity has really waned as the violence has increased. And these cartels are really adept at propaganda. They're very adept at using a kind of, uh, I call it narco-terrorism throughout Mexico uh, these images of violence, of, of uh, terrible things going on, are, are sort of washing over people every day. So there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. But I think uh, I'll, I'll end with um, just the observation that, that I think there's oftentimes a failure to understand here the extent to which the Mexican government really has been uh, trying in a variety of ways to find a solution to the conundrum of the law enforcement problem in Mexico. Uh, these people know, they're aware of the extent of the corruption, in, in especially in local and state police forces, but also at, at other levels of government. There is an awareness, but also it's true that the Mexican law enforcement has been basically forgotten for 30 years. You had 30 years of complete neglect poor wages, poor training, very susceptible to any kind of organized crime influence. And so to try to change the direction of that situation is an extremely complex problem, and it requires lots of uh, multi-dimensional efforts to respond. So thank you very much, and I look forward to further conversation with you about this. Great. And thank, <clears throat> thank you, Ricardo. I should point out that um, I believe your slides are available, or have we? Um, the, the, the obviously, there's an extraordinary amount of more detailed information for anyone that's available. Maybe you can, um, we can make them available yeah, to I'd people be glad. Sure. Uh, after, be um, after this panel. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Adam Hamilton, who is the president and CEO of Signature Science LLC. And I, I have to say, I'm 
really gratified to have somebody from the private sector. This is, again, uh, another thing that the Strauss Center loves to see, bringing people from the public sector, the university, and the private sector all together to discuss uh, these issues. So um, we're uh, grateful for you being here uh, today, Adam. Thank you very much. Good morning. How are you? It's a real honor to be here today. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be able to address you, and I'm very honored to be on the same panel with some very good friends and new friends who are, have very illustrative careers and uh, are great mentors for many of us. Dr. Lauderdale, in particular, thank you for all you've done for the Crime Commission. I am on the Crime Commission and with the Longhorn Leader Program as well. And Admiral Inman, thank you uh, again for your service during your time on our board, and congratulations again for the award last night. It's a, a well-deserved honor. And uh, Dr. Eftgrove, thank you. I think he might have left, but thank you for allowing us to use this uh, beautiful facility. It really is an amazing opportunity for us. So uh, I'm a technical person. Some people might call me a geek or a nerd. If you've been in my office, you probably know what I mean. Uh, David Carter might have seen before. And that I love technical issues and problems, specifically those that might be related to the spread of disease. In, in humans, in plants, and in animals. I love all of that. I have a very strange passion, and therefore I could probably speak on this topic for hours on end. But there is an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I will start my app right now, and so I have a green light here for 12, 10 minutes, yellow for two minutes, and then it starts flashing red, then it goes black, and I usually turn it over and keep talking anyway. But. Uh, <laughs> If you, see it, if you see it change, please advise me and I'll uh, do my best to stay on time. So thanks again. I wanted to talk today about something that I call the artificial border. And I'll tell you why I call it that in just a minute, but there's three main points that I wanted you to leave with today from my short time with you. Number one is that plant health and animal health in Mexico and in Texas are inextricably, inextricably linked. We cannot separate plant health, animal health, and human health in Mexico from plant health, animal health, and human health in Texas. Now, right now we are speaking specifically about the Texas-Mexico border, but the same issue can be applied to any of our international partners, any other country. We have interconnections that go so deep that really make it impossible for us to separate threats in the plant area, the, the animal area, or the human area, and I hope to make that point clear this morning using the Texas-Mexico border as an example. Now, that was specifically on the animals and plants. The human health issues are even greater. The human health on the southern side of the border and the northern side of the border are linked for reasons we'll talk about in just a minute. And these issues can't be left out of any discussion that we have about true border security and international border security. Lastly, I, I wanted to make a point, and it's not a political point, I'm an apolitical nerd, technical person, but stopping bi-directional, and that's important to say bi-directional movement of people, of animals, of goods, services, and products does not fix, does not completely address the problem that we have with health, public health, animal health, and plant health between Texas and Mexico or between the United States and any other international partner. So those are the three points I'd like to emphasize in my few minutes left, and we'll come back and revisit those at the end. So between Texas and Mexico, what really separates our countries? Well, there's a word I, I love. It's called anthropogenic. That means man-made. So indeed, there are some man-made differences between our two countries. Currency, and I put a question mark after currency because really, in actuality, you can take dollars into Mexico, you can spend pesos in Texas. So currency is somewhat of a, a, a differentiator between Texas and Mexico. Language, you can speak English or Spanish in many parts of both of these areas. Culture, the culture is, a, is starting to become more homologous. That is, it's more the same south of the border than, and north of the border. The governments are different. Okay, so there's no question mark there. That is something that distinguishes Mexico from Texas. And there is a boundary. That boundary is our border, but that's artificial. It's anthropogenic. It's man-made. Because naturally, there is no currency. Livestock, plants, and animals don't have any currency. 
Language, there's really not any. Culture, government, none of that. What there is, is a river. And you might recall that river is the Rio Grande. It goes by several different names, and it's been around for a long time. But all during its history, plants and animals have moved across that boundary without restriction, without passports. It's just, it just happens. There's nothing we can do about that part of it. And even though we call it a river, many parts are dry. So if you think that the water in the river itself is a barrier, well, in many areas, there is no water there. Where there is water, instead of being a barrier, it's really a magnet for different kinds of animal life and plant life and people, in fact. They come to this area because it does have water, and then it's easy to, trans to transport that water in either direction, bi-directional again, and enter the other country. For many, many years, there are many different kinds of river crossers, and no amount of customs agents, no amount of fences, nothing we can do, no passport controls, no policies, can stop a lot of these things from crossing this barrier or border that we call the Rio Grande or the Texas-Mexico border. Birds, how do you stop birds from transitioning or tra crossing over from country to country? Ruminants, that is grazing animals. How do you stop them? Predators, insects, we can't build an insect fence between our two countries. Fungal and bacterial spores, and while these may sound very benign, these are really how many plant diseases of, of significant economic consequence are transmitted is by fungal spores and bacteria. These are wheat rust spores, in fact, in that micrograph on the bottom of the page. Now, there are a lot of animal concerns or animal pathogen. A pathogen, I'm sorry, is, is a, a disease-causing organism, typically a virus or a bacteria. And I'm sorry for the gross picture, but I hope you'll forget it by lunch. This is a, a picture of foot and mouth disease. Have you heard of foot and mouth disease before? You know it's been problematic in many parts of the world. The United States has not had a case of foot and mouth disease since 1929. Korea is fighting, is battling this problem right now. Mexico has had foot and mouth disease more recently, but it's a very bad disease. It's not in and it of itself a fatal disease, but the consequences of the disease are usually that we end up putting large numbers of animals down. It affects any cloven hoof animal, if you want to recall what a cloven hoof animal is. Do you remember Spock from Star Trek? You can do that, you remember that? Okay, an animal that has a bifurcated two-part hoof like that is a cloven hoof animal, and they are susceptible to foot and mouth disease virus. So that includes cattle, pigs, and many other animals of economic significance. So FMD is the big one that we're concerned about now. I'm, I'm intimately involved in a national program to move our only FMD laboratory in the country from off the coast of New York to Manhattan, Kansas. So that's a very interesting process. Blue tongue virus is one you may not have heard of before, but I bet all of you could diagnose it because what do you think the first sign is of blue tongue virus? But this is sweeping across Europe right now. It's probably coming to the Americas sometime soon, and I think you'll hear more about blue tongue virus, especially now that you've been sensitized to that name. There's a lot of swine fevers and other swine vesicular diseases that are coming or have been here in the U.S. Newcastle disease virus, this is what's called a zoonotic pathogen. That is, it not only can affect animals, but it can also cause illness in people. Avian influenza, you've heard a lot about. Hantavirus, you've heard a lot about. And other things like Venezuelan equine encephalopathy are concerns that we have and that we have to be concerned about not only what's in the U.S., but what's in Mexico, again, because we're inextricably linked. Just a little aside, since I still have green light on my, my iPhone here, on FMD, I mentioned that we haven't had FMD in the U.S. since 1929. But what many, many people forget is that Mexico had a significant FMD problem in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And in fact, the U.S. mounted a paramilitary, really a military operation deep inside of Mexico to eradicate all of these affected cattle in Mexico. So we were there for six years. It cost us $200 million in dollars between 1946 and 1952. We lost 16 people in the process and wiped out most of the Mexican cattle industry. We don't want to have those kinds of problems or issues again, and we certainly don't want to respond in the same way again. 
So we have to be proactive in how we address these kinds of concerns. The plant concerns are not really as interesting, frankly, to me and I imagine to you, but there are a lot of different bacterial and fungal spores that we talked about that can cross any border, any fence, get past any station, any guard, that can cause problems and disease in our crops in the U.S. We are still a breadbasket of the world and the implications from these kinds of epidemics are very problematic. On to the human health side. Nationals from both sides, U.S. nationals go to Mexico for medical treatments. Mexican nationals come to the U.S. for medical treatments. People usually seek medical treatments because of an illness. So we have this natural transfer of potential disease and outbreaks going back and forth that we have no control over right now. The familial relationships across the border span the border and are very deep. And so we can't stop people and families that are separated by our artificial border from tra traversing that border and potentially spreading disease, especially in the intimate environment of a family. The incubation period, that's the time between an exposure to a disease and when you start to present with symptoms can be days. And so we can monitor for fever, febrile disease monitoring, but we can't guarantee that we can pick up everybody who might have some fever as they're coming through a border crossing point. The immunization, the prophylaxis, and other therapeutic strategies that we have and implement in public health are often not as effective because of the rural nature of many of the border areas. So we have a lot of problems with public health along the border, and I call it public health border porosity because we have really just begun to scratch the surface there, and I would really hate to see us, in the name of security, to make negative progress in the public health border security areas. So there's a lot that happens, a lot of different kinds of ways that public health threats, animal health threats, plant health threats can be transmitted back and forth Again, bi-directional from Mexico to the U.S. and U.S. to Mexico in the form of people and other living objects, which are called vectors, inanimate objects, which are called fomites, aerosols, and waters. And what I want to make sure that we take away is that border security and biosecurity are not the same thing and sometimes have conflicting goals and, uh, and objectives. So, in summary, we talked about three things that I would like you to take away today. One is that the health of plants and animals on the Mexican side and on the Texas side are linked. There's nothing we can do about that except address the problem together with an integrated strategy and philosophy. Two, the Texas-Mexico border in particular is very porous with respect to human public health issues. And three, stopping the bi-directional border movements of people and things is not the solution to our problem. Now, I'm not saying that a fence cannot be part of the solution, but don't be fooled or lulled into submission and think that that is all of the solution that we'll need. So we really do need an integrated public health infrastructure with Mexico and our other border countries and other international partners. A bilateral integrated solution is needed to protect not only human health, but our agricultural infrastructure to avoid famine, disease, and economic chaos. We've seen indications of these perturbations that uh, can cause real problems in our markets, in our economy, and I think it's up to us to make sure we include these kinds of precautions in whatever border security solutions we come up with. 12 minutes and 20 seconds, I'm on red, <laughs> and I think I will take questions uh, in a few moments. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Adam. Very well done. 12 minutes and 20 seconds. That's perfect. Um, our next uh, speaker, Michael Lauderdale, is in many ways the intellectual inspiration for this conference, and uh, we are absolutely grateful to have him here. He's the Clara Pope Willoughby Centennial Professor in Criminal Justice and has perhaps thought um, uh, more about some of these uh, pressing issues than uh, anyone out there. So we are grateful to have you here. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I am delighted and intimidated by the scholarship of my colleagues, including your technology, Adam. I have a buzzer that's going to go off in 12 minutes, uh, and uh, perhaps sometime you can give me some tutoring with regard to being a little more sophisticated in terms of that. 
I'm going to apologize in that uh, it's going to like uh, be trying to get a sip of water from a fire hydrant. I'm going to go very, very quickly in terms of trying to speak broadly to the kinds of things that are going on today. I've got this set uh, to run uh, automatically. I may have to back it up. Our purpose today is to provide some facts about the border, including frequent misperceptions about Mexico, to identify broad forces of change, to forecast likely conditions, and to estimate how deeply and fully Mexico is a failed state. And that's going to be my emphasis. America is the world's largest economy. Mexico is the 12th largest. Two to three million legal border crossings every day. We share a 2,000-mile border. Half of that, 1,000 miles, is the Texas border. We're an older people, Americans, uh, 36 years median age, Mexicans, 26. America is quite wealthy and well-educated. Mexico is poor and needing education. This is the border. Uh, in fact, I like to think of it in geological terms. The river is really a subduction zone. Two plates are colliding there, the American plate and the Mexican plate. When we think border, I think 200 miles on either side. So we're reaching down to Monterey, we're reaching up to Austin, and this is what the border looks like. Very arid country, uh, with the exception of the coastal plain in Tamaulipas, where you have sub uh, substantial rainfall, but very erratic rainfall. That's the territory that we look at when we talk about this border that these two countries share. Mexico is very interesting, and I have to be a bit of a historian and an anthropologist, if you'll pardon me. For more than a thousand years, a history of conquest, migration, and conquered people. First European contact began with the conquest over the Aztec Empire, itself a colonial power over other Indian tribes. Mexico then saw for the next 450 years successive revolts against Spain, France, large landowners, the Catholic Church, and as late as the 1940s, American and British oil companies when Mexico expropriated oil uh, uh, interest. They sustain a revolution about every 100 years. They have a very brittle response with regard to change pressures. We tend to move more slow, slowly, then more abruptly. This is Mexico City before European contact, before Hernan Cortez. The con conquer of Mexico, Mexico went, we think, from a population of 10 million to 1 million in about 150 years as Europeans demolished the Aztec civilization. About 200 years later, a Catholic priest, a renegade uh, uh, Catholic priest, Hidalgo, called for a revolution against Spain, mobilizing the Indians, the mestizos, the new race, the Carrillos, the native born there. A hundred years ago, we have some more revolutionaries. Uh, if you don't recognize those people, that's Pancho Villa with the Bandoleros and Emiliano uh, Zapata. Uh, another potential revolution almost occurred in the 30s and the 40s, and this was uh, communist penetration into Mexico. Mexico today is a uh, decoupage, if you will, of a variety of cultures, of issues, of peasant armies. It's also a mixture of ancient, a Mayan temple, the great cathedral, built with the stones from an Aztec uh, a pyramid, the angel of Mexico, uh, traditional dress in Guadalajara. This is the Mexico I think most of us think about when we think about Mexico and uh, the delightful peoples and cuisine, bullfighters, a sombrero, the Day of the Dead in November, a welcoming poster from the Mexican government, a saguaro cactus, they don't even grow in our part of the country, a guitar, a zarapi, a sombrero. Come visit Mexico, a vacation, uh, we have uh, dancers, a giant city, 24 to 26 million Mexico City, and the beautiful beaches of Western Mexico. I think this is the Mexico we often think of, but there's another Mexico, and my colleague spoke to that, 35,000 violent deaths in the last four years in Mexico as Calderon has attempted to alter the control of the cartel. Not a Mexico that we're as familiar with. These are soldiers, mass soldiers in Ciudad Juarez, uh, Barrio Azteca, a gang member, a binational uh, uh, gang in El Paso and Juarez, a wanted poster from Sinaloa, the western part of the state, dead bodies south of McAllen in Mexico. This is a New Mexico for many of us that is starting to emerge. Significant issues. I want to speak real quickly to major features about Mexico and the U.S. Economies, demography, and cultures. All right, number one, if you say close the border or put up cameras, that's just foolish. Basically, our economies are heavily integrated. That's a map of the trade routes. 
the United States gateway to Mexico is via Texas. So the significant part of our presentation in here today is the role that Mexico plays within this subduction zone of these two cultures coming together. This is the major Mexican economic engines. They export oil from the Bay of Campeche. Temporary workers, those are the people that do framing and mow our lawns, tourism and services, more than 70% in Mexico. That's the kind of employment. Light manufacturing, maquilas. And the fifth are drugs, human trafficking, and extortion. I've just given you the five pillars, if you will, of what the Mexican economy is about. Now let's uh, take that apart. Manufacturing assembly of 130 billion yields about 10% profit. Tourism, 185 billion, about 8% profit. The visiting workers sending money back to Mexico, about 30 billion profit. Petroleum, 15 billion. The last is narcotics. Narcotics is a hugely profitable activity, yielding perhaps 80% profit. So it should tell you a lot about the power of the cartels to corrupt, to buy their way, and that is how profitable that fifth pillar is. Major security risk. This is really critical for us. We must import 70% of our oil. We're a major empire. We've got interests all over the world, and so we have to be concerned about a secure border in terms of people coming in from another part of the world, like uh, Libya, to do us harm. Me Mexico's security risk, they have a history of revolution. Great wealth disparities. With unemployment, in terms of my numbers, not Mexican government numbers, perhaps 50%, potential food shortages in urban areas, failure of oil exports, and that's coming, I think, in three years, and then, of course, cartel violence and breakdown of civil order. So those are two very different sets, if you will, of security risks as we look at the kind of macro features of uh, each of the countries. Most significant threat, I would say, in terms of our program here today is not drugs, not the cartels, but the interruption of the flow of oil if we are facing, and I think we are, the decline of Mexican oil fields. This causes the collapse of the Mexican middle class paid by oil expo exports from Pemex. These are where the salaries come from for the police, particularly the federal police, for government workers, for teachers, physicians, and nurses, the export of oil and the cash that is earned. How critical is that for us? Well, we have to import 65 to 70 percent. We get it from Canada, number one, Mexico, number two. You saw the rest of the list, not close friends. <laughs> this is peak oil. Basically, if we look at Mexico, their production is rolled over and declining. My read of the, of the energy data is we're three years out from Mexico not having enough oil for their domestic, domestic uses, much less to export. Cultivation of opium poppy. We're seeing other kinds of production in Mexico in terms of sending things up here. 2000, uh, 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 2001 September, we were able to interdict the flow of cocaine through uh, the Caribbean. It now has moved through Mexico. China is a significant source of, and I'll back that up just a second, a significant source of the starter chemicals that are used for methamphetamines and ephedra. So part of globalization has meant that Mexico is a receiving point of very, very serious drugs that come in here. Uh, I'll go to this, and Greg, I know you're on the panel here today, so you'll speak about that in more detail, but businesses have arisen in Mexico to move the drugs in. These are the cartels, and it is not simply something that goes on in Mexico. This data is three years old. Every state in the union has the presence of Mexican cartels or operatives associated with them. I'll summarize with regard to Mexico. I'll read it, may have to back it up. We can't stop the action of the drugs cartels in Mexico. There's too much money and too much history of government corruption. Simply put, the cartels have more money to do what they're doing than Mexico or the U.S. With Mexico as the U.S. third trading partner and the U.S. being Mexico's number one trading partner, we can't close the border. We're economically intertwined. As long as American drug consumption is high, money from drugs will fuel the cartels. Violence will migrate increasingly into the United States, coming first to Texas, as cartels work on vertical integration of manufacture, transport, distribution. They're good capitalists. They're like Walmart. Back that up. Uh, more corruption will, uh, will appear in U.S. law enforcement. They buy uh, law enforcement there. We have to worry about it here. Cartel violence will be episodic, with drug lords achieving some hegemony and then losing it through competition and government uh, efforts. Only when good-paying jobs are developed and greater public revulsion against drugs and violence will some larger success be achieved. So one of my messages is we've got to attack economic kinds of issues, otherwise there's this endless supply 
of young males and young females that little, little hope is offered, that's who the cartels recruit from. That's the critical issue. I would argue it's a time for clear thinking. America's greatest strengths are in its, our institutions of civic participation. God, LBJ was a champion of that. Openness, flexibility, and innovation. Probably our greatest weakness is our pride, our hubris. Mexico's greatest strength may be its youth and antiquity. Rico, I'm going to yield to your uh, uh, ability to uh, handle that better than I. I think Mexico's greatest uh, weaknesses, though, are fatalism, lack of civic trust, brittle response to change, and huge ancient uh, institutional corruption. Oh, my sound is coming on automatically. Markers of a failed state. Citizens lose respect for the state and ability to maintain civic order, failure to protect citizens, little trust in state institutions, including police, courts, and currency, and inability to maintain geographical integrity. People migrate out. Texas could go from 3 million illegals here to 10 million. And this is the Mexico that we're starting to see. And let me caution you, some of these presentations are barked off. They're very frightening kinds of things. We're a mature audience. We can handle these. This is what Mexican citizens, this is what Mexican children are watching. This is the Mexico that has begun to appear, Rico, in the last three years. That's Juarez. Drug capture down near Monterey. It's a migrant labor camp in Houston. Father Hidalgo. Fall 2010, Acapulco. Michoacan, people on the south side of the Rio Grande when they see a federal agent, Falcon Lake, we know what that is. El Paso UTEP campus when the shootings occurred. My students, spring break, our <laughs> students. Central American migrants en route to the United States killed in Tamaulipas. Cartel territories. We'll look to our speakers this afternoon, they'll get into that in greater detail. We're now flying interdictions into Mexico. Back that up, that's a former football player from Laredo, got involved across the river, La Barbie. You see who that is? The frequent scene today, spring break again. I've looked at this carefully, spot kids are in my class. Acapulco, that lady is in my class, I think. And then that. Five agents shot. Most popular digital game today. Call of Juarez, the cartels. You should recognize this, this 20-year-old student who's getting a degree in social work and criminal justice from uh, a university in Juarez. And I think it speaks to some of the hopelessness that I see with regard to what is going on in Mexico. That young woman is not what is needed in terms of tackling the challenges from my perspective perspective that we have uh, with regard to Mexico. Frank, if I may, let me explain my title, The Dying Elephant, and, and then I'll, I'll step down. About 25, 26 years ago, I was counting it up. I was sitting in the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. I had a large grant to apply things I'd been doing in the state in terms of using ge ge geographical information uh, and uh, demography to mirror and, and forecast population changes and population needs, in effect. I was using the kind of terrain mapping things that uh, geographers and uh, uh, geologists use in applying uh, population values to that. And I just spent a series of very difficult meetings with Mexican colleagues trying to get accurate estimates of populations in various Mexico cities. And interesting enough, Rico, uh, the one that I was particularly concerned with was Ciudad Juarez. I used to live in El Paso and remember that city very fondly. Uh, and kept asking my Mexican colleagues, one of them was Jose Laguna, who had been dean of the medical school and kind of adopted me. And uh, I, I was saying to them, I said, I need good estimates of the population in Juarez and your official estimates from several different sources vary by 30%, and I can't use this. How do I find out the population of Juarez? And Laguna put his arm around and said, Miguel, you've got to understand Mexicans are different than Americans. And I said, yeah, I'm starting to understand that. And I said, but I need the population of Juarez. I don't want to talk about cultural differences. And he said, I'm going to tell you how you get the population of Juarez. And I said, I'm all ears. And he said, you ask your cousin. You always ask your cousin. That's the way you find out things in Mexico. Well, I won't use the language uh, to here today that, that I used at, at that point. So I'm sitting in the embassy and I'm talking with the chief civilian there, Perry Shankle is his name, and I said, Perry, how in the hell am I gonna be able to get done in Mexico what I can get done in Texas because I can't get good data? 
uh, and, and he just told me that there was going to be a strike at the airport, and I'd need to fly home, see my wife, and, and then go to Washington. So he said, you need to leave today because you're not going to be able to get out tomorrow. And so I was grumbling about things. And I said to Perry, I said, Perry, why do we put up with this stuff? I mean, Mexico is, is, is so very different, and I sometimes just despair of being able to do some of the kinds of things in Mexico that I can readily do here. And I, I said, what is your answer to that? And he said, those of us who work with Mexico, we frequently have those conversations. But he said, I will tell you what we're always left with, and that is, is what do we do with a dead elephant on our doorstep? And, and, and so I end this presentation saying that the cultures and the economy and the destiny of the United States and Mexico are intertwined. We cannot wall Mexico off. We cannot ignore Mexico. I think what we have is a huge challenge in terms of how we develop partnerships, how we work with the situation. As I look at what Rico is talking about in terms of what's going on in Juarez, as I look at Adam's presentation, saying these are complex uh, relationships and a reality that goes far beyond drawing a line in the sand and saying don't come across. So that is my concern and, and what I see. Austin is 240 miles from Laredo. We're part of the subduction area. We're part of the zone. If we have a situation where we say, if you've got money, come to the States, run away from trouble down there, We'll empty talent, we'll empty capital from Mexico, and we're going to leave behind, you know, there's 115 million people there, we'll leave behind 80 million. What are they going to do for food, water, shelter, those are the kinds of things that in effect have made me make the decision that I want to talk about a dying elephant or a dead elephant, not something that will exist independent of us and will be a nice place for my students to go, I no longer do that, but to go to Cabo San Luca or go to the Yucatan for spring break. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Well, as you've seen, three extraordinarily uh, rich, um, informative, in some cases provocative presentations. And I thought, I noticed some large themes that I'd like to lay out for the panelists just to think about as we begin to think about our discussions and questions. Uh, most of what we saw today was laying the groundwork, the situation that we see, and I think a lot of people in the audience, and myself, after seeing something like this, are interested in thinking about potential solutions as we move forward. That's, I imagine, why a lot of people are here. Three big themes that I saw that, that I think need to be discussed in terms of these solutions. Uh, the first is the long term versus the short term. Uh, there seems to be a tension between, we, ha we have a crisis right now, and some of the solutions that would be put into place to deal with the crisis right now might not be the things that are best for long-term solutions. I was thinking, um, Ricardo, of your uh, presentation in terms of the use of the military, which for someone who's a historian, I get very nervous about the idea in terms of civil military relations of the military policing. Short term, absolutely necessary, it sounds like. No other solution long term. That scares me for a lot of uh, reasons. But other things too, what uh, the Dean mentioned earlier about the balance between social justice, which everyone recognizes is needed, but also becoming part of the global economy. The tensions there, globalization has clearly made this problem worse, but it also provides some of the solutions. Also political reform, obviously uh, after uh, you know, Mike's presentation, the institutional reforms that are needed are absolutely crucial, yet do we have the time to have those political reforms when we face uh, this sort of uh, time bomb? Second issue, the U.S. role. I think we're all interested, what can the U.S. do to help this situation? Um, uh, three things that I'm thinking about here. To what extent is direct support useful or helpful? Um, uh, to what extent is being involved directly, would it make the problem better or make it worse? Uh, and also, I liked how Adam put the sort of bi-directional thing. We were, we had a, um, uh, we had the uh, real privilege of hearing an off the um, record briefing the other evening from a top uh, intelligence figure uh, who said, look, you know, the border goes in two directions. We are sending money. We are s purchasing drugs. We are sending guns there, right? If you're in Mexico, you can imagine 
that us having this conference complaining about what's going on there is slightly problematic. What can be done on our side of the border, not just in the obvious kind of way of, of uh, border control, but in terms of dealing with our own set of problems that are contributing to Mexico's uh, 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 crisis. And finally, I loved Adam's discussion of the border, our, our sort of imagination of what borders are. As you look at the natural world, of course, these borders are completely man-made. Uh, they don't exist in nature, although I think the way you described sort of the Rio Grande and the place coming together, there are some natural borders. Is there something that has to be done in how we reconceptualize the border? A lot of our political rhetoric is about putting up walls, tightening the border, making this border even tighter. But on the other hand, in an age of globalization, we see in every other possible realm of uh, human activity, borders collapsing. How should we imagine this border? Are we thinking about it, conceptualizing it incorrectly? So those are just sort of three big thoughts that emerge from these excellent presentations that I would throw out to each of you and then maybe give you a, a, a little time to respond both to that and to the other um, comments of your fellow panelists and then we can open it up. Frank, could, could, could I jump in sure. uh, if I may, colleagues? Uh, because I think my presentation was a, a, an austere and uh, looking over the abyss kind of thing. If we look at the resources that exist in Mexico a, a, as an example, I think there are still large amounts of oil as an example, and, and we're going to have to, 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 to look at the import, uh, importation of oil. I think in the next decade, we have the opportunity through Pemex, through other kinds of entities in, in Mexico, to improve their ability to uh, uh, secure the resources that, that, that exist there naturally. So that, that's one very important kind of thing. I think secondly, part of what happened in, in globalization and part of the unemployment in Mexico deals with the far cheaper uh, rates that Chinese and, and Indian labor charge. I was uh, on the UNAM campus, uh, I was telling a colleague last night uh, when the uh, uh, Chinese military ran over the uh, protesters at Tiananmen Square. And my very liberal Mexican colleagues cheered when that was happening. It was on the television. And I said, why? What is this about? And they said, you don't understand, Mike. If China comes into the labor market, their wages are so much lower than ours, it will devastate Mexico. With oil rising in price, and, I, and I'm being very global here now, it changes the availability, the competitiveness of Chinese labor relative to products produced here, and it, it increases employment opportunities within Mexico. So I think this is a decade of great change. Mexico has huge resources. Currently, Rico's done a really very good job about speaking to the kind of dilemma that exists right now, but if we can take a longer term view and work prudently and thoughtfully within this decade, there are certain events that are happening and resources that exist there, that's the opportunity I see. Excuse me for jumping in on that, but I ended on a real downer note. I wanted to come <laughs> back and say, hey, there's an opportunity space that's huge out there. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Well, I think there's a, a number of things to be said about uh, solutions and uh, directions, but uh, one, one observation is uh, the $40 billion in profits that, that, that Michael outlines for us, uh, that's a huge percentage of the money coming into Mexico, right? I mean, if Mexico's GNP is somewhere around $225 billion, then $40 billion is a big chunk of that. And that money is not going to 200 corporations and another couple of hundred wealthy individuals or whatever. That money is going into a handful right. of criminal organizations. So, so they've got, uh, and they don't pay taxes, you know. So, so that money has a, a, a sort of an amplified effect in terms of this problem. So one issue that we have to face here that, that's, that's important for us to think about is the use, the, our consumption of drugs, for right. example, how we're generating those profits from Mexico. Uh, you know, when I give these talks to my students at UT, for example, I say to them, look, you know, you know, my guess is that if you look at the statistics of drug use, is that probably 50% of you or, or more have, have smoked marijuana, have maybe done cocaine. I said, you need to connect the dots here. You need to be aware that when you smoke that joint, unless it's homegrown, you're participating in this carnage. You're part of this problem, and you can't 
deny that. And so I think raising people's awareness of these connections that are currently not, and I'm not taking that as a moral position in terms of it's good or bad. I mean, that would have been fine if California had legalized marijuana, you know. I think it, whatever your, your views about that are, there are concrete facts about these linkages. And if you buy uh, any drugs in an American city, the chances are that you're one or two steps removed from somebody who has a direct relationship to these cartels that are committing this violence. So I think it's important for us to have uh, public awareness, for, have to have, for us to have conversations uh, about those linkages. That would reduce the profits in, in, in these cartels. Uh, secondly, I think the, the uh, Plan Merida, which is our, our sort of uh, key intervention or, or response to this problem in Mexico, I think it's anemic. I mean, we spend more than $1.4 billion in a week in Afghanistan. And this is what we're spending in Mexico over the course of uh, several years. So I think our uh, leaders need to sort of be more aware of exactly these points about the, the, that we're not disconnected. We can't disconnect ourselves. And this is a key country in terms of the well-being of the United States on all sorts of dimensions. So I think we need to think about what kinds of additional resources and support we can give to the Mexican government um, in this effort, because it, it can't be all done um, just over there. We have to kind of uh, continue and deepen our relationship to this situation. Well, Dr. Gavin, if I could perhaps uh, address your questions in a somewhat different order. First, I, I would uh, like to speak about the U.S. support role in direct support, particularly. I think with uh, today's economic climate and our own fiscal woes in this country that what we need to make sure is that direct support does have a very specific and identifiable benefit to our own society and to our own needs. Now that's not to say that it also can't be beneficial to the Mexican government and Mexican nationals, but I think we need to be very smart about how we do the direct investment. And in terms of the, short, uh, the shorter problems or the more urgent issues and problems, at least in the public health side and the animal health side, there are many therapies and systems that can be used and can, in fact, there, there's evidence-based return on investment potential in these systems that can be used to actually provide benefit for both sides of the border if it's done smartly and not just dumping money into any country, Mexico or any other foreign country, without some kind of direction control and or insight on how that money is spent and what kind of return the American taxpayer should get on it. And I don't mean that to sound political. Again, I'm a technical person, but as a technical person, I would like to see metrics on how effective our direct contributions might be. Longer term, there are two significant issues that I think we need to invest in that, again, have evidence-based significant return on investment. Those are education and prophylaxis. And the education is critical, particularly in the healthcare area. The recognition of signs and symptoms, the response, and providing some fundamental level of uh, public health vaccination programs, animal health, plant, plant health awareness programs, we know would have a significant impact. We have to be able to get this information to people in rural populations on both sides of our border, and doing so will greatly enhance our mitigation efforts to uh, prevent significant outbreaks of disease that could impact either public health or our economy through the agricultural sector or animal health sector. And lastly, a more costly option is to really look at investment in additional surveillance programs, whether they're automated or manual surveillance programs for human disease, animal disease, plant disease, again, on both sides of the border. These are all things that uh, I think are worthy of at least assessment and consideration for direct investment in the border issues that we face with Mexico. Terrific. Why don't we uh, open it up to um, the audience? And if you could identify yourself, too, although a man who needs no introduction, <laughs> we'll lead off with.
Absolutely. You're right. Well, if I could uh, respond to that, I think those ideas are changing. I mean, I think there's unprecedented collaboration between the Mexican government and Mexican law enforcement and U.S. law enforcement. There's the number of extraditions of uh, uh, these uh, cartel people to the United States, for example, under, in, in the last three years is several orders of magnitude above what they had been before. So I think that's, yes, but it, really important. I think a lot of Mexican law enforcement are, are increasingly being trained in the US. And I think that's creating a kind of a shared vocabulary and sort of worldview. Um, so I think that's one part of it. But I think the, the problem from the Mexican government point of view is that talking about evidence-based, that, that's, that counts on that side too. And Calderon and his people need to be able to show that these changes in worldview are yielding real results on the ground in Mexico. And to date, we don't have that. W even though they've taken down many people, you've got a, 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 a country in a state of crisis in terms of law enforcement security issues. So that's the challenge. So I don't know how we can do more than we have. I mean, obviously now there's several new wrinkles in the situation. The, the, the recent announcement of drones, for example, that's, that's a new development, et cetera. But what we need is also to be able to show that those kind, that kind of cooperation is yielding real results that Mexicans can feel. And then I think that they will be more eager for these kinds of uh, reshaping of the, of the kind of the historical perspectives and the relationships between the countries. Right. Two elections, actually, yeah. here and there. Could, could, right. could I respond? I, I think another way in which we here in Texas can be effective in helping the United States see Mexico and understand Mexico is to be more active. The current uh, 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 ambassador of the United States to Mexico just resigned. Uh, Terrell Blodgett uh, took me to his presentation when he was here, I think, Terrell, uh, in, in October. Uh, and no personal criticism of the individual. It seemed like a very capable individual. But I think we have to think of meta messages we may send. His background is he's not a Mexican-American. He's a Cuban-American, and, and we may see all Hispanics as, as, as alike, but that's a complex world, and, and a Mexican is not a Cuban. Secondly, if you looked at his area of scholarship, it was failed states. So it, 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 those kinds of things may send a message that we need to think about, mm -hmm. and, and that is, do we p pick an ambassador that maybe doesn't fit the Mexican profile of what Americans are, and do we pick a, an ambassador who's area of act academic expertise and considerable expertise, as I understand failed states. Mexicans, Rico, you'll speak to it better than I, are very proud people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, an ancient culture, a, a culture that feels if it stumbles, it's often the gringos that, call the st that cause the stumbling there. Texas, more than the, uh, any of the other border states, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, has a marvelous and long-term 
good relationship with Mexico. So we should, if we are able through our political delegations, that is a good example, through our universities, help guide the United States to a more sophisticated understanding of Mexico and help Washington, D.C. understand that Mexico may be uh, of equal consequence as Afghanistan or Libya. Uh, and I would argue that's not the case right now. Open it up to others. Well, I think um, it's not the solution to this entire problem, but I do think that it would help uh, reduce the profitability of one of the sources of income for the cartels. I think it might also change our kind of relationship to this issue. There's obviously there's tremendous widespread drug usage. And I think if we had more of a legalization posture, some of the resources that we're spending on law enforcement could be more efficiently spent on rehabilitation, drug interventions, and stuff like that. But I also think that cocaine is the big profit maker in this deal. It's not marijuana. So I, that's not, you know, if you think about a kilo of cocaine in Colombia costing about $3,000, in Mexico, that kilo costs you about $13,000. And once it crosses the border, that kilo is costing about eighty dollars or $90,000. The profit margin, it's a lot easier also to slip a kilo of cocaine in the United States than a ton of marijuana. So the, the, the sort of the, the logistics, the, the whole sort of structure, business infrastructure that's required to manage these products, I think the same thing for methamphetamines that are very profitable. So, so marijuana is probably the least profitable of the drugs that are part of this mix. So it's complicated. I'm not an expert on, on uh, that part of the Mexican economic structure, but if you remember the, the, the three points that I said are part of the Mexican government strategy, the third was, was uh, uh, fortifying institutions. And part of that involves significant reform of judicial uh, strategies and so on, trying to usher in a, a judicial system that's not based on the, ho the Holy Inquisition and uh, Napoleonic law and things like that. But that also includes kind of revisiting some of these issues. Now, politically, uh, the current government is, is really running into all kinds of obstacles uh, in that in the Congress, in the Mexican Congress. So, so uh, but yeah, I think that's probably one of the variables that, n that needs to be addressed in order to create a more robust economic system.
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the thing is that in Mexico, that reality has changed so much. I mean, when I, I was born and raised in Mexico. I came to the United States to go to college when I was 17. So when I was growing up, you could not find any American appliances, candy, cars, anything like that. Had you, you got into Mexico either illegally or at a huge tax rate. So there were no franchises of the U.S. Uh, you know, there were no subways or uh, McDonald's or any of these kinds of things. Today, you go into Mexico, and every city has those kinds of franchises and so on. So, so there's been a tremendous change in terms of, of that issue. That, that sort of the, and NAFTA is obviously a big part of that. So I think there's plenty of evidence for that. It may not be yet to the point that we need it to be, but... Um, but certainly there's been a huge transformation in the fluidity of, of those kinds of arrangements and compared to the protectionism that was in place through the 1960s and 70s. See it. Hand back there. My name is Mariano Torres. I work with a school title guarantee in the international division, so I'm familiar with some of the Mexican laws regarding that. Foreign ownership. Uh, just to be brief, Mexico does allow foreign ownership of property. It does impose limitations on foreign ownership uh, near beach areas and also near uh, uh, border limits. But in those cases, usually what happens is that the foreign investor going in sets up a trust to where the property is held in trust by, by a Mexican financial institution, and those trusts are for about 100 years or, and, and can be renewed, and the ben beneficiary is the foreign investor. So that's usually how uh, those transactions are set up. I, I, I can only say, as, as I look at energy statistics, as I look at oil consumption in this country, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at 200 buck a barrel oil very quickly. That's going to translate into $5, think about $9 a, a gallon gasoline. Mexico cannot pay for its middle class without a vigorous uh, oil export activity. And so I suspect that reality is starting to make itself known within Mexico, and I think that we should begin to push the advantage because I think there is a lot of oil, again, it's, it's on the Gulf of Mexico side in the Bay of, of Campeche there, if in effect uh, a, a more sophisticated uh, group of entities could be involved other than Pemex, they're, they're compromised in so many ways. So I, I do think that the reality that the Mexicans are starting to face, and you'll know this better than I, Rico, that they're, they're going to have a shortage of funds. They're a net importer of food, so it's not just funds, but it's also food coming into Mexico. And I think those fundamental kinds of things uh, can temper passions with regard to land ownership. There is an awareness in Mexico that uh, the oil fields are faltering and that something has to be done with Pemex. But Pemex has uh, emotional and symbolic value mm -hmm. that's the problem. So it's a, it's a political problem, not, I mean, the numbers are clear, the, the, the rationale is clear, but being able to muster the political leverage to make it happen is the challenge right now. Of those strategies 
Uh, well, uh, yes, to some extent. Um, what happened in Colombia is that um, there was a, a sort of a two-part strategy, to, or, uh, uh, and that involved both social programs as well as military law enforcement slash law enforcement intervention. And I think this is uh, 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 an awareness that the Mexican government has come to slowly. That is, the first uh, two, two and a half years of this war against the cartels, um, it was primarily and almost exclusively a military operation, law enforcement operation. Uh, Last year, in, uh, in January of 2010, there was a massacre of 14 students in Juarez, the Villas de Salvarca students. And it turned out, that, uh, this, this was like a watershed moment uh, for Mexico and the Mexican government. Um, within a month, in February, uh, uh, Calderon sent his entire cabinet to Juarez. And, uh, they have uh, adopted, the, uh, it's basically the Colombian plan being uh, deployed in Juarez, which involves about $340 million in uh, social programs, working with NGOs, trying to build schools. This is a topic that I wasn't able to, to really talk about in my presentation, but, but there's been like a perfect storm from Juarez because uh, 50% of its economy is run by the assembly plants or is a function of the assembly plants, and most of those do work for the U.S. auto industry. So when the U.S. auto industry collapsed, uh, something like 80,000 jobs were lost in one year in Juarez. So there's massive unemployment. You've got 40% of the city living in, in uh, communities that share one high school. So all of these are part of the problem of you know wh who's joining gangs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the Mexican government has uh, been trying to build, I think, five high schools in the same area, has been doing uh, other programs in conjunction with the law enforcement part. And so that, that's basically the Colombia plan applied in Juarez. I think we still don't know what the uh, results will be from that effort. But that is a change in mindset. I think we have time for one or two more questions. That's my passion. So yes, I believe it is a huge threat. What we see, and I don't want to turn it into an infectious disease seminar, but <laughs> wherever we have an aggregation of people mm -hmm. and they interact frequently in conditions that may be substandard from a hygienic perspective, and they interact with certain species, in particular some avian species and some swine species, you have a, a technical interaction of the genome of some of the pathogenic materials that may cause things like swine flu or bird flu. And you have the potential for creating or developing, evolving new diseases that are of potential pandemic concern, not just local, not epidemic, but pandemic worldwide concern. We've seen this historically coming out of places in Asia where the cultures uh, do have poultry and swine and people in the same environment, and that's not I'm not saying that that's an a culture that we should avoid, but that's just their cultural practices. We've seen some of these developments there. So uh, anytime you have conditions and large numbers of people that don't have adequate hygiene or adequate education or adequate prophylaxis in the form of uh, preventable disease vaccination programs or adequate therapies for the treatment of relatively common bacterial 
uh, diseases in particular. Look at what happened in Haiti. Cholera is an easily treatable bacterial disease, easily treatable but we can't effectively do it because of a lack of distribution systems, a lack of education, a lack of awareness, and sanitation. sanitation. So yes, I'm very concerned <clears throat> as we see a, a decline in the middle class, in Mexico in particular, that uh, we, can, we may see some of these human public health issues become exaggerated because of those reasons we just talked about. On the animal health side, the most contagious disease that we know about for any mammal, plant, I'm sorry, any mammal, human, cow, pig, whatever, is foot and mouth disease. And that's why I brought that up. And I can't figure out why we haven't seen FMD in this country since 1929. It's, it's amazing that we haven't seen it yet. I'm convinced that it will be here, and the U.S. and many other countries are actively involved in research programs that will be used to uh, basically stop those outbreaks, but it's, it's very complicated. Once you have foot and mouth disease, you cannot export your beef products or your, your other products that might be affected. So one case, one case anywhere in the United States shuts down our exports, and that would have significant economic consequences. And you think, well, why don't we vaccinate? Well, we do have vaccine, vaccines for FMD in particular, seven serotypes. But as soon as you start vaccinating, right now our diagnostic tests don't allow us to differentiate between uh, vaccine positives and disease cause positives. So if you start vaccinating, you also lose your export status. And this isn't just between Mexico and US, this is an international issue. And so we will probably, uh, with the amount of the globalization as we've, we've talked about this morning, uh, we will see FMD again, foot and mouth disease again. And um, we have, the United States has, has many very solid practices in place to try to prevent the introduction of foot and mouth disease to this country. But we need to encourage those same standards, same surveillance, same level of awareness and education in Mexico. Because as we've seen, this is basically one large integrated organism. And it doesn't do us much good to spend a lot of money protecting all of our ports of entry and all of our potential entry points for these infectious diseases if the partners that we have on the North American continent don't have the same kind and level of programs to prevent the introduction of diseases there. And I hope that answered your question. I think we have time for one more question. That's all. Hand back there. I'll, I'll start it and, and uh, come back with a pitch for the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, fusion centers. The state has a fusion center. I think number one, and we've started, is to recognize what you're talking about. And I think everyone in this room probably recognizes what you're talking about. But I talk to reporters quite frequently in terms of other roles that I have and, and, and citizens. And, you know, people will, will ask me, you know, I want to go shopping in Nuevo Laredo. What do you think about that? Uh, so I think we have a, a, a large challenge there in terms of getting the public to understand that those sorts of things are going on. I, I think to the extent that we have cartel activity here in Austin, and I think that you would know. We've seen it uh, uh, very evident in the last couple of years. We have to recognize it. We have to prosecute it. We have to have effective partnerships between sheriff's department, municipal police, the state police, the DEA, the FBI. I, I think we're starting to, to deal with those kinds of things. So I see a dawning awareness from my perspective with regard to law enforcement, but huge steps have to be taken in terms of civic leaders, in terms of uh, politically uh, elected individuals, in terms of business leaders. I, I don't think we're very far down that road as compared to the extent to which we're exposed to those activities here in Austin. 
If, if I could add uh, one thing to that, I think I think emerging is, is the key word there, and I really, I think this kind of a forum is really useful and really important in relation to that. And the one sort of thing that illustrates it for me is that um, if you go, you know, we had about two months ago, the FBI took down about 100 people in the Northeast, you know, mafia people, uh, they were, they were bribing or demanding extortion money from strip clubs and things like that. And I went to the FBI website, there's only one person on that top 10 list who has any relationship to this problem. That's this guy, Eduardo Ravelo from uh, uh, Barrio Azteca from El Paso, not a household name. And I think there are probably a thousand people like this guy all over the country. I mean, I mean Michael's uh, uh, comment that every s significant city in America has the presence of cartel people. We do not have this issue on our radar sufficiently. And I, I thought that top 10 FBI list, most wanted, uh, that captured this problem. We need to kind of increase our awareness of this as a real issue here, not just down there. Well, I want to thank our panelists for an extraordinarily informative and really stimulating start to uh, today's proceedings. So please join me in thanking. <laughs> this is terrific. Thank you.